Father, as we come to this topic of the brain and how it works, we're studying because we'd like to bless the people in our environment, the people that you have put us in contact with. Lord, my go-to text is you have put your words in my mouth and you will hide me in the shadow of your hand. Make us living, breathing blessings is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm Lanny Ray Asen. I have a Bachelor of Science in Public Health from Loma Linda University. I uh, am honored to have been a health educator for a lot of years now. I work with Sutter Hospital and the Park District for the CHIP program in the Auburn area. We've hit a snag in the road, but I am not quitting. <laughs> God is good, and he has a plan. We're gonna, I promise I'm watching the clock closely. We're only going to take 10 minutes on the anatomy of the brain and the nervous system, and then we're going to get right to the stuff you actually want to know. Rocket scientists, we're so glad. Every glass needs one. Okay, what is a neuron? It's a nerve cell. It's the basic building block. And do you remember, what, what did a cell look like when you studied it in biology, high school biology? It's a little round blob with organelles in it. It's got the mitochondria, the Golgi bodies, all this cool stuff. This does not look a bit like that, does it? This is your basic, everyday, run-of-the-mill nerve cell. Called a neuron, we have dendrites, is this busy stuff out here. That's where the change happens that starts the reaction. Then we've got this long part that's called an axon. That is the road down which the nerve impulse travels. These little breaks in it, breaks in the myelin sheath, enables the message to transport at many, many times the speed it would if we didn't have this myelin sheath. What is the myelin sheath? Does anybody remember this from high school? It's a layer around the axon of the nerve. Now, why is it important? Have you ever heard, have you ever had someone say, oh, my nerves are just raw? If you were wiring a house, the electrical wires have something on the outside of it, what is it? Insulation. This is the insulation of your nerve. If you did not have it, the electrical current flowing down that nerve would be hitting spots on the nerve that it was never intended to hit, and your body would be in serious distress. Uh, when we get to the disease portion, we're going to talk about what happens when this myelin sheath isn't there, but this is what we're talking about. Under a microscope, the myelin sheath looks white. Um, so, I think that's the most important part from this picture. A single neuron, one cell, that's all this is. And it's that huge. And it does so many amazing things. Here's another picture of the neuron. We've got the gaps that enable the message to transmit really fastly. Messages flow in this direction. It starts at the dendrite, goes down the axon, and ends up at these terminals where it jumps to the next nerve. And this happens so, so fast. Uh, the message goes from your brain to your foot faster than you can think, faster than you can snap your finger. Okay, human brain, two hemispheres, four quadrants each. There is no computer made that can compare with it. I have an artificial nervous system in my body. I have 16 working electrodes in the epidural space of my spine. I lived on the bed for five and a half years before I got my first computer implant. And this technology is amazing, it is phenomenal, it lets me stand up here and get to be your teacher, it's a really cool thing. But I'm here to tell you, mankind with their best cannot duplicate what God originally created. The human brain, uh, I, I got here just for the end of Dr. Moore's presentation and he said, this is the part of your brain, this is why Satan created drugs. Satan is an indiscriminate destroyer. He will be glad to take out any part of your brain he can get at. We have a responsibility to guard our thoughts, guard our, guard our health habits, so that we can keep this beautiful machine in good working order. Another view of the brain. So many cool things out there. Your entire body runs out of it. And the gray and white matter. You've, we've all heard of gray matter. Does anybody know what the gray matter is? The outside of the brain, the cerebral cortex, if you look at it, is gray. It's one part of the nerves. But those axons that are covered in the myelin sheath, they're white. So when you look at the brain, the gray matter's on the outside, and the next layer in is all those coated nerve cells. Okay, we can turn this puppy off. 
The picture I want you to take with you today is of a massive landslide. If I left here today to go back to my house down in the valley and I-80 was closed due to a rock and a mud slide, could I still get home? Yes. Would it take me a little longer? Yes. Would I be blessed if I sat on the road and looked at the mud and the rocks? Paralyzed with fear is never a good place to be. So there's a big mudslide on 80. I have to get off the highway. I have to take a back route. Is my house still there? In all probability, my house is just fine. I can get home. If you have brain trauma, we're talking stroke, we're talking coma, we're talking uh, concussion, we're talking uh, severe blood loss so that portions of your brain are without oxygen for a while. If you have brain trauma, it's like a rock slide. Now, let's say it happened near your speech center. Is the speech center still there? It's like my house. In all probability, it's still there. But we have to have a new way to get there. That's why the two hemispheres, four quadrants each, is such an important thing to understand. Because the old way that your brain is used to accessing the speech center may be gone. And it may be gone for good. But the human body has the ability to make a new route. There are existing surface roads that can get you around to get to there. One day, I, I'm a chip director in the Auburn area, and I had a lady come in, and I was doing the initial in assessment, and she said, this carotid artery is completely occluded, and this one is 60% occluded, and she'd had a massive stroke, and she's got all these really cool scans from the Brain Center in San Francisco, and a completely occluded carotid artery. I brought a stethoscope so I could listen. And I held it to her neck. And when, when the carotid artery is clogged, you normally hear whistling. There was no sound. So I take the stethoscope back to the MD. I borrowed it from him. He goes, wasn't that cool? Didn't you love hearing that? And I said, I heard nothing. He says, oh, you weren't listening in the right place. Come here, I'll show you. So he takes me back in the room, and he puts it to her neck, and he got the most amazed look on his face because there really, truly was no sound. This woman was alive and functioning because as this artery corroded, as it occluded and shrunk down, and it became harder and harder for blood cells to get through, her body built a peripheral circulatory system bypassing it. Had her stroke come six months later, she might have never even known she had a stroke because the body was already preparing to provide blood to her brain. That's how cool the human brain is. So with the rock slide thing, sitting there looking at it does no good. Uh, there's a television program on called uh, Wind at My Back, and the grandma in it has a bad stroke. This is back in the Great Depression, and they're just learning about strokes back in those days. A nurse comes to her home, and they're going to bless this woman who's had a stroke. Uh, it's paralysis of the left hand and the left foot, and, and she had serious speech problems in the beginning. This nurse, several times a day, will take her hand and move it. And she says, as I do it, you think about your hand moving it. What are they doing? Training the mind. We're building these new pathways, a new roadway, if you will, because the mind has incredible recuperative powers this way. Um, as you work as a lay health evangelist, praise God, you don't have to diagnose mental illness, but you need to know it when you see it. So the majority of our time this morning is going to be spent talking about those kinds of issues. Do you have any questions on this little, I just skim the surface of anatomy. We don't, we don't pretend we covered it this morning. But this makes good sense, doesn't it? The rock slide thing, a uh, speech pathologist explained that to me several years ago, and that made good sense to me because there is another way to access it. And if that part of the brain isn't damaged itself, there will be a way to get into it. My grandpa at 90 had a stroke, and he was just not being able to speak. He spent one entire night in prayer. This man was not a Seventh-day Adventist. He was a 32nd degree Mason. The only prayers he knew were the ones that he had memorized as a Mason. And he, in his heart, is calling out to the God of heaven with the only prayers he knows. And as the sun rose, the Holy Spirit brought him the thought, if you will speak, 
slowly. Just go slow with each word. You will be able to talk. And that was the day Grandpa started talking again. So there is, it's always appropriate to pray. One of the challenges in my life right now, I, I work with the native population a lot. And the chief's son is 43 with, and he's hearing voices. I hear about someone hearing voices. My mind instantly goes to schizophrenia because that's a common symptom. And the voices get worse with alcohol, which may or may not. I mean, I'm in no position to diagnose what's wrong with anybody. So she says, will you come and pray? That kind of a situation where you may be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with demon possession type set setups not only requires a whole lot of prayer and knowing that there's nothing between my heart and God and that I have prayed in my family and, and my church is well protected, um, you don't know what you're going to find when you get there. So it's always okay to ask. We have the right to take anything to God's throne. And we have the right for him to be glorified in all situations. I, the outcome has nothing to do with me. I get to be there and I get to pray. And God will handle all the stuff he needs to handle. That's the good news about mental illness. Okay, now I'm going to be, who wants to tell me what depression looks like? Dark, gloomy, that's a good place, to, that's a good start. Someone who is depressed, what, how would you know they're depressed? No, no, motivation. no motivation, slow. Hygiene. Unkempt. Sometimes hygiene issues, unkempt. Does it always look like that? No. Not always. Asking what depression looks like is almost like asking what do people look like? Because it comes in all kinds of forms and it looks like all kinds of things. Just an example, a depressed person, some depressed people, stop eating and they get thin as a rail. Some depressed people seek comfort in food and they just eat everything in sight. So how, as you go into the field, are you going to recognize if someone is depressed or not? You're going to, talking, but more than that, listening, because they're going to tell you if they're depressed. Uh, it will, it will, it will seep out. It, even though they planned that no one ever know, it will seep out and you will hear it. Symptoms of depression, persistent, sad, anxious, or empty mood, feelings of hopelessness, pessimism, feelings of guilt, worthlessness, helplessness, loss of interest of pleasure in hobbies and activities that were once enjoyed, decreased energy, fatigue, they're slowed down. I'm giving you these notes so you're safe. Insomnia, oh, they wake up early in the morning or they can't go to sleep at night, it's really awful. Or they sleep all day. I mean, it can be either one. Uh, we talked about appetite, thoughts of death or suicide attempts, restless and irritable. They come unglued at things that normal people should not come unglued at. Persistent physical symptoms can go along with depression. These people have stomach aches, they have chronic headaches, they have all kinds of stuff. What do you as a lay health evangelist need to know about depression? It's treatable. The quotation I gave you in the beginning is that lifestyle can affect the chemistry of the brain. So what lifestyle things do you know that could bless a person that has depression? Exercise, Exercise number one. Nutrition. nutrition. What about nutrition? That's a good one. You're right up my alley. <laughs> what about nutrition can help someone who's depressed? They need, the more you study the brain and the nervous system, the more persuaded you are that you do not want to be on a completely oil-free diet. Because that myelin sheath that insulates, that protects your nerves, that is composed of fatty acids, and if you are not eating them, your body cannot synthesize them, and you are gonna end up in a world of hurt. You need a, 100 years ago when I was at Loma Linda, the saying was, eat a wide variety of unrefined foods in sufficient quantities to maintain your ideal weight. Nobody wants to remember that. Foods as grown, which is the chip mantra. You need a wide variety. Specifically, people with mental health issues need those fatty acids. And from a vegetarian standpoint, ground flaxseed, my favorite one are those little chia seeds that you can use as an oil replacer. Put one part chia seed to nine parts water, 
and in 30 minutes you can use it instead of oil in your bread and your bread comes out absolutely beautiful and you've got all it is the single richest source of omega fatty three acids on the planet it's better than any fish seed oil out there and we all need to be eating it it's a good thing okay yes i put raw chia seeds in water one part chia seed nine parts water and let it sit for 30 minutes and it will make it's a very loose gel but you can use it in salad dressing you can use it as an oil replacer in your baked goods i have made muffins with it i have made loaf bread with it and it was amazing i made for one of the classes i taught in auburn i brought a loaf that was made with olive oil and a loaf that was made with the equal amount of chia seed the olive oil loaf had browned just a little bit more because that's what fats do the chia seed loaf had the same texture, the same flavor, and except for the fact that the outer portion was a little bit lighter, it was every bit as good. So, chia seeds. Did you know that the uh, Native Americans that lived in the Colorado mountains, when they were coming to California coast, walking to the California coast to trade their stuff for our seashells, the only food they took with them was chia seeds because they knew they could be sustained. The Aztec warriors in, down in South America, when the Spanish got here and were fighting, they didn't understand these people because they could fight from beginning till dark and they never quit. It's because they had chia seeds in their pocket. Well, during the day, they would eat the raw chia seeds all by themselves and they knew it. It's a great source of protein and it has these essential fatty acids that sustain them and can keep them going. So that's my pitch on that. Actually, I do, um, and I will bring it to you when I see you next Friday. Uh, Nuts Galore is one place. The best price I've ever found on them is through Azure Standard out of Oregon. It's hard to order them in Colorado. Okay. It's hard to, get, hard to get them out of Azure. Is it? I don't know why. Well, because people have become aware of how valuable they are. Whole Foods right now is the closest one to it that has good quality. That has good quality ones. Where's Nuts and Nuts Galore was a site I found online. It's a little more expensive than Azure, but they'll ship direct to you. And um, I shouldn't quote the price because it's been several months since I looked at it. But this, these things, to you and I, I mean, adding chia seed to your diet's not a big deal. But for someone who's suffering, the fact that you cared enough to tell them can mean the world. Okay. I do. I, I believe in, in standing beside them as they go through the process. So if I can take chia seed to their house and I can mix it in front of them the first time, and after it's sat there, if I can turn it into a salad dressing so that they see me do it, then they're much more likely to stick with it. If I just drop the chia seeds off and say, oh, here's the chia seeds we talked about, the chia seeds are going to sit there. So, and, and another thing with depressed people, especially the ones that aren't eating, if I take them a really good vegan something, and sit down and eat it with them, they're much more likely to get the nutrition in them than if I just talk to them about, you know, you really should perk up your, your diet. In fact, I will probably have known them for a few months and been feeding them before we get around to talking about diet. When they start telling me, you know, I'm feeling better, I don't know why, then we have the chance to say, well, let's think about it. What are we doing different? What's different in your life? Oh, yeah, we have had several meals together. Oh, yeah, we, you, you keep taking me on that walk. And let them see the kind of people they are to around them. God, God would open interesting doors. What do you know about ADHD? I'm trying to keep my eye on the wall. Adderall is one of them, yes. There's one that begins with a D. But it doesn't matter. They give those to help boost the serotonin level in the brain and help people concentrate better. Are there things we can do naturally to help the brain? Sure there are. What are the symptoms of someone who has ADHD? Did you say lethargy? Restlessness. There you go. Uh, this, any, what else? can't concentrate, They're restless, they fidget in their chairs, they, uh, they get out of their chairs when they should be sitting. 
don't follow directions easily. Um, the first time I saw the list of things for people with ADHD, I go, well, this is every eight-year-old boy that ever lived. I go, let's be kind. They don't all have ADHD. Um, but they'd like to get them all on drugs. Well, this, by, I mean, when you look at the list, and I'm giving you the list, it's every eight-year-old boy that ever lived. So, who requires medication? Well, that's something only their parents can decide. But if you're the person that's standing beside the parent and they want to talk about it, how do you know when it's appropriate to medicate and when it isn't? Number one, that's between the parent and the health practitioner. If that child is miserable in their own skin, there's nothing worse than being alone with your own mind when you're scared of your own mind. And if this is distressing that child, if they are not functioning, if they are miserable, then we need to move heaven and earth to try to help that baby. And if it's an eight-year-old boy who's eight and is going to be nine and ten someday and be okay, then let's let the kid grow up and be okay. Does that make sense? What about ADHD has been identified and it's been around long enough now that we have lots of adults who have it. What does ADHD look like in an adult? Very similar. Hopefully, they have learned some coping techniques that will help them function at a high level in their world. These are high energy people who can accomplish a tremendous amount of stuff when they're channeled. So we, as a society, should have a vested interest in helping people with ADHD get a handle on what they have and functioning well. A man I had just met and did not know well went to a big conference with me down at Loma Linda. And I mean, there were guest speakers and I mean, famous physicians from all over the country. Amazing lectures. And we're sitting at these tables and this man's at the table with me. And he would come to the table and listen to the announcements. And when the really good stuff was just ready to start, he'd disappear. Well, now, I had invited this man to this thing, and I'm just about, fortunately, I prayed before I opened my big mouth. I'm going, Lord, what is going on? No adult pops in and out of a lecture of this quality. It's not done. It looks rude. And so I'm sitting here in my humanity getting ready to go, okay, what's up? While the lectures are going on, he's out in, with the vendors at their booths visiting. And it just looks really inappropriate to me. Before I open my mouth, thank you, God, this man comes in and pulls up a chair beside me. He said, just so you know, he says, I have ADHD. And he says, I am recording the lecture so that I can listen to it in an environment where I'll get it. Thank God he knew what to do. This is a high-functioning, amazing man, but he knew what to do and how to do it. And rather than have me sit there and get angry and unhappy with him, so much better to just say it. Um, you, you meet people sometimes, adults, and you go, oh, he's got ADHD. And it would be so much better if they could just say, you know, I do have this, and this is how I cope with it. Hopefully they have good techniques for coping with it. Um, what do you know about bipolar? It's one of the tragedies of our day. Two different personalities. Seems like it, doesn't it? These are people. This right here is where you and I live. We live right there in the middle. We have highs, and praise God we have them, and we have lows, and praise God he gets us through them. But someone who has bipolar, in the olden days they called this manic depressive disorder, someone who has these, their highs are just obnoxiously high. And their lows are a depth that you and I have no idea. And they cycle between them. They have so little time in this part where you and I live. These people need our compassion and our prayers and our love and our understanding. It is a horrific, ugly disease. And there are medications that are very effective. Lithium, Depakote. Um, lithium is, is an element, and the first famous person I knew of who really, really suffered from this was Patty Duke Aston. She was a famous TV star back in the olden days. And she would work on her television show, at, or she would work on a movie, 
And when it was over, she would go to bed for three or four months. The woman couldn't move. When they got her on lithium, it changed her life so much. She went out and told the whole world. She says, you need to know what this disease is. She said, I had no idea what was wrong with me. When she was up, she had so much energy, she could go for days. And when she was down, she just didn't want to eat, didn't want to move. The depression was intense. Um, I was injured when my son was nine months old. So we have only the one child. And my husband was an only child. I come from a big family. And when my family gets together, it's a tremendous amount of fun. So my husband had always thought that we wouldn't have just one child. We'd have kids. And uh, once I was injured, that wasn't going to happen. So um, we ended up, there was a little boy. When our son was nine, there was a little boy who was six that uh, needed a home pretty bad. And uh, we said, okay, he can, we'll take him in. We legally adopted him, nearly destroyed us. Uh, this little boy was bipolar. And his highs, he, it just broke your heart. His high was the closest to being a normal kid I ever saw him. He, sometimes his speech, he'd get to talk in a little, you knew, that, you knew that he was in one of those manic phases because he was talking. This is a kid that didn't hardly ever speak unless he was in the manic phase. But his depressions, it just broke your heart. When I, when I got him diagnosed, I called his grandma and said, his mother, you need to get her to a doctor, I'll bet you that she's bipolar. This woman had had a suicide attempt, all kinds of stuff. Before we leave the subject of ADHD, forgive me if I'm a little disjointed here, the reason you want to get it identified is because it can bring with it companion conditions. If the ADHD is left undiagnosed, if the person doesn't develop coping techniques, they're apt to turn to drugs, they're apt to turn to alcohol. Suicide, depression happens when they don't figure out what it is and how to deal with it, it brings these other things. Now with bipolar, this manic depressive stuff, they've already got built in depression. They've already got that built in manic phase where they're going a mile a minute. Symptoms of bipolar are people that stay up for days on end. Uh, oh, I could put this little boy to bed at night. And he would force himself to stay in the room until he thought we were all asleep. And then he was up and he was busy and it was scary. Um, periods of abnormally elevated, depressed or anxious moods, periods of decreased need for sleep, grandiose notions. Oh, when they are in their manic phase, their genius is in their own mind. That's, <laughs> I don't know what more to say about them. Um, increased talking or pressured speech. Some people that have this, they get to talking so fast that they can't get the words out. It's, it's very frustrating to them. Their thoughts race, periods of marked increase of energy, periods of poor judgment, inappropriate social behavior. Oh, when they're young and you're trying to teach them how to behave, they don't have normal boundaries. And you can sit and you can have a talk and you can be on the same page and they get it and everything is wonderful. And the next day, it's like that talk never even happened. That the ability to put stuff in the brain and process it and keep it and have it accessible, depending what phase of the cycle they're in, that part just doesn't exist. This is a bad, it, this is a tough one. Um, the single biggest piece of good news I found as I looked at bipolar, both on the internet and through the textbooks here, was there's a new study out that says large doses, and they did not define large, but large doses of the fatty acids, we were just talking about the chia seeds and the flax seed, can actually help stabilize some of the roller coaster for these people. So if, I, if, if this little boy was still in my care, he's a grown man now, but if I still had access to him, I would give him ground flax seed on his breakfast cereal, and I would make him salad dressing with chia seed in it, and I would be sneaking those fatty acids in, and I would never say a word to him because talking about it does not help. Whoa. Um, the aging mind. There is good news on the aging mind. Let me read you something. <laughs> a 
Light splashed this morning on the shell pink anemones swaying on their tall stems. Down blue spiked Veronica light flowed in riverlets over the humps of honeybees. This morning I saw light kiss the silk of the roses in their second flowering. My late bloomers flushed with their brandy. A curious gladness shook me. I can scarcely wait until tomorrow when life begins for me. When life new, sorry, when new life begins for me, as it does each day, as it does each day. That was written by a 95-year-old man. When you age, your vocabulary does not decrease, your IQ does not decrease, your reasoning ability does not decrease unless you are suffering from a lifestyle issue, such as dementia, formerly known as senility, when we were, when most of you aren't old enough to know that, but, but in the olden days they called it senility, then it became dementia. Then we learned about Alzheimer's. Um, my grandmother was one of eight children. All three of her sisters and two of her brothers, five of the eight, lost their minds to Alzheimer's. Back before it was a common diagnosis that we knew what it was. Um, when I was a little girl, my family was taking a trip to Southern California. My grandma went with us so she could visit her sister that lived down there. I had not been told, I was all of six at the time, I hadn't been told what was wrong with Aunt Dolly and I didn't, I'd never met Aunt Dolly. This was grandma's sister, I didn't know her. This dear woman had all the stuff we see with Alzheimer's. What are, you tell me, what are the symptoms of Alzheimer's? Memory loss. Uh, it, it usually starts with today's memories. They can still access the memories from old, but, but today's memories are gone. Don't recognize, as it progresses, they don't recognize close family members. They lose all that. Agitation, irritability. Strange habits. See, yes, that's a good one. What else? Articulate speech. I mean, never use a swear word in their life. Sound like drunken sailors when Alzheimer's takes over. They, they say things come out of them that they would have never, ever in their lives said. They often go through <coughs> periods of time when they are physically violent. They strike out, and it, it's it's a tough disease. Grandma's sister had this and and she said well who are you and grandma would introduce herself I'm your sister I'm they called her toots she says I'm toots I'm your sister and they'd talk and she'd go now who are you it robs the person of who they were and every relationship they ever had and they're scared as they're going into it which is part of why all the acting out happens how do you bless someone who's going down this road the amazing thing about Alzheimer's, um, a very articulate, well-dressed woman who had Alzheimer's is on her way into the dining room at an, assist at an assisted care facility. That woman could sit down at the piano and play Fleur de Lis perfectly. Perfectly. The, the part of her brain involved in creating music was fully functional. She would play it, and she could play it a second time. And if her husband didn't step up and gently take her by the elbow to lead her into the dining room, she'd have played it a third time. The part of her brain that knew how to play that song was perfect. The part of the brain that knew she had just played it wasn't connected. And with Alzheimer's, you're not going to be able to build a new road around it. The rock slide has come. We need to talk a little bit about the progression of Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's starts when you're in your 40s. Yes. Yes. And what Alzheimer's really is, by the time you're 85, one in four people is affected. So yes, if you've made it past 40 and you have no symptoms, this is good. Um, there's hope for all of us here. But Alzheimer's is a situation in which the brain has accumulated debris. We used to think that Alzheimer's was a disease that created plaque and what they're calling uh, tangles in the brain. I'm going to tell you what those are in just a second. But now we know for a fact that the plaque and the tangles in the brain make the Alzheimer's. It is not the other way around. This, is, this was a huge thing in science when they got that figured out. Now tangles, if you look at it under an electron microscope, 
look like twisted railroad ties. They look like serious solid structures inside the neuron. Inside the cell itself, you got these, these things that look like railroad pieces tangled up, and it makes the cell non-functional. On the outside of the neuron, you have this gummy stuff that the electrical impulses cannot get around. That's the plaque. So someone with Alzheimer's, you have a, a glob of this plaque and these tangled nerves. It's like the rock slide, but with Alzheimer's, it can be growing in multiple parts of the brain at any given time. And it really does start in your 40s. And how do we prevent it? What can we actually do? We're back to the lifestyle thing, people. When I was about 16, Grandma and I were together and alone, and she was talking about these brothers and sisters. Of the eight of them, two died too young to show signs of Alzheimer's, and these other five all had it. That just leaves Grandma, and she's scared to death of losing her mind. And I, I was a little prayer warrior as a child, and uh, Grandma's talking to me about this, and I said, well, Grandma, Mrs. White says that God will use scripture to protect your mind. I said, we should pray about this. As you study God's word, ask him to use his word to protect your mind. Grandma lived well into her 90s and had her mind every day. But she always said, you know, I had the Adventist diet. She ate way better than any of the brothers and sisters did. And God's word literally, we believe, protected her mind. So, really cool thought. As we age, we don't have to get worse, but there are lots of things that can make us worse. Now, what exactly is, if Alzheimer's is this one disease and dementia is something else, what in the world is dementia? It doesn't have all the symptoms of Alzheimer's. It does not. How long has dementia, severe dementia? Severe dementia. My father-in-law came to live with us, and I had him for over five years, and when I got him, I recognized there was something really wrong. Um, and he lived, uh, his wife passed away. And I'm the one who went to Oregon to stay with him and arrange the funeral and bring him home and all those good things. We knew she was passing, so we had made arrangement. We knew we were going to bring him to our home. I, was, I had everything ready. But I got there, and Grandpa was in the driveway of a house he had lived in for 18 years, looking like a deer caught in the headlights. He did not know where he was, and he was not exactly sure how to get back into that house. And this man was still driving, and every time we got in the car in a town he'd lived in for 18 years, we ended up someplace other than he'd intended to go. And when we would go to visit, Marilyn would tell him every single thing to do. My husband would go, how can you stand that? It must make him crazy. Well, once we started living with him, we realized this was how he was functioning at such a high level. She made all the decisions, she made all the choices, she told him what to do, and he was more than happy to do it. And he had always been that way. He had always been happy to have a woman in charge, and this worked for him. When the day came that uh, the health, I had Kaiser insurance for him, they did brain scans on him. When I, when I first got him, I go, I need help in knowing how to bless this man. Having raised a kid with bipolar, raising children, my theory was you tell them what's coming, you tell them what to expect so they know they won't be caught off guard, they won't be surprised, and we can walk through it in peace. Someone with dementia, you do not tell them what's coming because they can stay awake all night worrying about this thing that's coming. And I did not know that. So I went to the health professionals and I said, there's something going on here and I don't know, how to I don't know what to do. So they told me, they said, they studied him, they did the test, they said he is only processing 30% of what's coming in. Whether it's verbal or whether it's read, he's only getting 30%. This dear man would watch a television show and all of a sudden he'd be mad. I mean, it's, it's, and it's because he was trying to fit the commercials into the storyline? Yes, it was terrible. Um, once I realized what was making him so angry, I would put in a DVD, a nature DVD, that had the scenery that he loved, and no commercials, and then he was okay. Um, as we were coming back to California from Oregon, when I went to get him, I, my husband's mother passed away uh, the Christmas before I met Roger. And I'm going, well, this will be great. He can tell me stories about Lois, his first wife, Roger's mother. Not only does this man not have the memories from today, 
with his dementia, he also doesn't have the memories from a long time ago. Praise God, my car had a tape deck in it, and I put him in charge of the music, and then he was happy. He was bound and determined he was going to drive from Bend to the Oregon border, and then I'd drive the rest of the way. <laughs> I had every health professional in town trying to help me convince this man that, no, he really needed to let Lanny do the driving. Do not argue with these people, because you're not going to, if, if, if the discussion progresses, they're just going to dig in, and you're taking something from them. You, you just can't let it go there. So with a lot of prayer and a lot of patience and asking God to put his words in your mouth and hide you in the shadow of his hand, you just have to say, Lord, I need to be in the driver's suite when we leave Bend. And Grandpa's bound and determined that's where he's going to be. I need you to fix it. Sometimes God gives me words to say to reorganize the situation. Sometimes God just works it out, and I never have to open my mouth, and that's kind of my favorite times when God just just handles it for me. Um, as you deal with people with mental illness, you're going to encounter this stuff. Know that God is the way, the only way you're ever going to be able to bless anybody is when God blesses them through you anyway. But in mental illness in particular, we need real wisdom and understanding. The one we hadn't covered that I really, there's two more that I wanted to cover today, and Rhonda's already here, but we're okay. I want to talk about OCD because you hear about it a lot. What does OCD look like? Obsessive Compulsive Disorder is what it stands for. This can look all kinds of ways, too. What are some of the ways it looks? Shutting the door in the same way every time. Doing the same thing every time. A little girl walking to school has to count the cracks. It starts out with her having to count the cracks. Then we start counting the little things that come off the cracks. What used to be a 10-minute walk becomes three or four hours as she dissects all the cracks in the root. Um, it looks like the person whose house is absolutely immaculate, perfect, neat, and you dare not move one thing. I got invited to a friend's house. Uh, she's a member of the church where I attend, and I was waxing eloquent about lentils one week in the Sabbath class. She said, I don't know how to cook lentils. I said, oh, honey, they're the easiest thing in the world. I said, I'll come over and, and we'll, make a, we'll make a batch. She looked kind of, she looked a little bit like a deer caught in the headlights. And she said, well, okay, we'll set that up. <laughs> and I go, well, there's something here I don't know. Uh, she and I had become friends, I thought. And so she's going to have knee surgery. And she needs a pot of lentils in her house. And she needs to know what to do with them. When I went to her house, I was going to cook the pot of lentils and show her a couple different things to do with them so that they'd know what to do with these lentils. She says, now Michael does a lot of the cooking at our house. She, this woman had a stroke at 21 years of age with three little baby children and the right side of her body, she was right side dominant to this day. This was 25 years ago. She still has the effects of the stroke on the right side of her body. It affects her, the, the right arm is almost useless and the right leg, she walks with a very unnatural gait. So I knew knowing how to cook lentils would bless this household. I went not knowing what I was walking into, and her husband, she, her husband comes, and inter I'm introduced, and he says a couple things, and he leaves. And I'm, me, I'm just fine. I'm cooking the lentils, we're putting the onions in, we're getting them seasoned up. And he comes back, and we talk some more. And he leaves. And he turns right around and comes back, and we talk a little bit more. Visits going swimmingly, I have no idea what's going on. But you can see his wife, my friend, every time he comes back into the room and it's okay, she just breathes a little bit easier. I, I leave the house and I go, God, I don't know what that was all about, but may you have been glorified by whatever it was. I don't know what I was in there. A couple weeks later, she calls me and she says, Michael liked you. I'm like, well, you, people normally, I mean, I don't turn off too many people right on a first meeting. And, uh, you know, I said, well, good. I'm, I, I enjoyed Michael, too. She goes, no, you don't know Lanny. The whole time my kids were going up, they could never have a friend come over to the house because they might touch something and move it, and Michael would explode. And she said, my kids never got to have people come over. She says, I don't have friends over to the house because I'm afraid for them to meet Michael, and something will happen, and this is OCD, how it plays out in this man's life. And it varies and it comes on in different ways. Often it can be related to a traumatic incident. But there's a story of a five-year-old little boy 
who has to check the locks on all the doors in the house. He has a specific routine, which door he goes to first and how he makes his path through the house 25 to 30 times before he goes to sleep at night. This is crippling stuff. Agoraphobia, fear of the marketplace. These are the people. And agoraphobia often goes hand in hand with obsessive compulsive. I'm not off topic here. Does he? How does it manifest itself in his life? You can't, you can't go across bridges. Can't go across bridges. Yeah, you, can't, I mean, you, you can drive, but sometimes you can't. And he just like, doesn't like being around some people. Kind of stays at home. In Michael's life, the agoraphobia is just really starting to rear its ugly head. He will go as far as Roseville, but no further. And he will, and you can't drive on the highway. You've got to take those little back roads we've been talking about. You have, she, the, wife ha, the wife has to do the driving. We have to take the back roads. And, you know, it's off. These people, if it gets bad, eventually they won't leave their home, and eventually they won't leave a specific room in the home. Their world is not a safe place for them to be. They need our prayers. They need our support. They need to know the benefit of sunlight. They need to know that exercise will help them feel better. Exercise while you think, oh, huh, who wants to work out? Who wants to get your heart rate up? That's no fun. But you actually can relax and be more at peace after you've done it. These people, the lifestyle things that you and I know that we've known since we were kids can change their brain chemistry and bless them tremendously. Okay, in the couple of minutes I have left, what can you as a lay health evangelist do? You need to stand beside them through the process. You need to work with the medication, not against it. I have a new friend who, I have to be careful how close I let this woman get to me because she, she can make me crazy real quick. Um, she's like a dog with a bone when she hears about something, a problem, or a new something. She want, I mean, she just rips it apart. And, you know, if, if I, in conversation, say something about something that's going on in my life, she will move heaven and earth to solve my issues and make it all, and it's not even, not even any of her business. So she's got OCD in a particular form, but her big thing was the Greek word pharmacopoeia, from which our modern-day word pharmacy comes, in the New Testament, in Paul's writing, it's translated sorcery. So she believes all drugs are sorcery. All drugs are from the devil. Well, you have some with schizophrenia, and we didn't even get to that one. But schizophrenia, they're hearing voices, and they're doing all kinds of unusual things. These people... Mary, yes? I don't start until 10.50. So oh! Oh! So we're going to back up a little. Okay, we're going to continue here, and then we're going to hit schizophrenia. Um, this, they need those medications. The bipolar people that need lithium, they need that medication and they need to take it. The reason bipolar people pay, do not stay on their medications is they get addicted to the high. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to move mountains by their own manpower and the grandiose, the grandness of their own mind. They're going to conquer the world. They like that feeling. And the medication, they don't, have that same power in their own mind, so they quit taking it. We as lay people need to be able to stand beside them and say, I know that you would like to have that feeling, but you need, we need to listen to what the doctor's saying. There's a reason for not having that high, because you don't want to have that low. There's a reason, and, and I know you can't see it now, but that high is not as good for you as you think it is. From my perspective, standing out here outside looking at you, the high hurts, honey. You just can't see it. So that's what a lay health evangelist can do. That's one of the things you can do. We need to work with the medication, not against it. And St. John's wort is such a powerful herb that you have to tell the doctor you're taking it because it interacts with medications. Um, it may affect what antidepressant they decide to give you. So uh, let the doctors know what herbal things you're doing. No one's going to have a problem with a good diet and exercise. Everybody's okay for that. It is always appropriate to pray. I shared with the story of the chief's son. She wants us to pray for him. I get to ask God to fix it. It doesn't matter what it is. 
So we, as lay people, we have the right to be courageous. Um, and it's okay that we don't have the answers. I'm preaching more to me than anybody else right now. Because I'm the little gal that no matter what it is, I've heard something about it, and I'm happy to share with you anything that I've ever heard. That hurts more people than if I was quiet. So you really, I, my go-to text is, Lord, put your words in my mouth and hide me in the shadow of your hand, Isaiah 51, 16. Um, it is the only safe way to deal, especially with someone suffering with mental health issues. Because I don't know what their triggers are. I don't know what their hurts are. Only God does. If I am here surrendered to God, he will get the right stuff said. Even if I don't say the right thing, he can enable them to hear the right thing. That's the value of bringing prayer to your health ministry. Um, we get to be optimistic, even though the medical community is not. Because we know the great physician, we are allowed to be optimistic. My husband was out till 11 o'clock last night. Roger does hard manual labor. He needs to go home and go to bed. But right now, there's a 33-year-old man on one of Roger's crews that two weeks ago, tonight, was on the Forest Hill Bridge ready to jump. And he called Roger and he said, I am 33. This has been going on for 13 months. It's not going to be any better. I respect you, and I called to say goodbye. I didn't want you to hear about this from someone else, but, but I won't be there at, come Monday. And Roger said, oh, now wait a minute. Roger went and talked to him. And the next night, he called Roger, and they went again. And uh, by now, he's saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to end it, but I'm going to take my kids with me. I don't want them growing up in this world. And when you hear that, you go, okay, now we have to have mental health professionals involved. We have to have the police knowing because if something happened to those kids and I knew it was a potential and I did nothing about it, I couldn't live with me. Prayer is the only safe way through these things. Um, Roger talked to him, and this man wants nothing to do with God at this point. I believe that'll change as time goes by. Roger said, is there something physical going on with you? And the man goes, well, he goes, I got this strange thing in my side. It's sending blue veins up my side. And he lifted his shirt and showed Roger. And he goes, oh, I've never seen anything that looked like that. And uh, now it's in the center of his stomach coming up too. Roger has seen this man stop on the job site with chest pain. Roger said, you need to get to a doctor. He said, all this horrid stuff that's, that's making you think you want your life over, it could be medical. We need to find out if it's medical first. Man went to the doctor. They've given him 15 months to live. This, this thing that is sending big veins, that is making his veins evidently be big and stand out, it's some kind of a tumor. They say it's inoperable. And, okay, so now this 33-year-old with three kids, divorced with three kids in two different households, is the medical profession has said, you're going to die. Now what does a lay health evangelist do? Pray hard. I am praying for my husband. I don't know Jason worth a hoot, but my husband does. And they're the two that are going to So I'm, I'm backing Roger up in prayer. Yes, I am. And I want Roger to get to see God's goodness as we go through this crazy process. But is this man going to die? Unless God intervenes, there's a real probability that that's the outcome. But how he dies... Whether he dies at peace in the Lord or whether he dies terrified, whether he takes his own life and cuts this process short, or how this all plays out, as a lay health evangelist, this is where we stand beside them and go through the process. It is not for the faint of heart. Now, I want to talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. What is that bugger? It's linked to all kinds of things. It's linked to all kinds of things. What It can be caused by a traumatic event like war. It can be. Serving, Soldiers. Serving in, the mission field. serving in the mission field can cause it. It surely can. What is it? 
Okay, you remember the road, the mudslide that we started with? With post-traumatic stress disorder, you do not just have a really horrific, worse than you can imagine memory that happened back there in, at the war or whatever it was. When, your, when a nerve impulse starts going down that track towards the mudslide, the mudslide isn't just there, your body relives it. It's not a memory, your body relives it. Your heart begins to pound, your breath, you get shorter breath, your hands get clammy cold, you're ready to fly. Your mind races. You think if you cannot get out of there, you will die. It's that bad. Now, war can cause it. Seeing crazy things can cause it. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. Sorry it's as graphic as it is, but a 34-year-old woman, young mother, married, is a travel agent at a uh, travel agency. She's in the office by herself one afternoon. Two armed men come in. They rob her at gunpoint. Five times in 15 minutes, they hold the gun to her head, and the one man says, I will kill you. In her imagination, she sees her brains spattered on the wall. And before they leave, they make her strip naked. They lock her in a closet. They do not physically assault her at this time. It's awful. Months later, this woman's entire life is in shambles because the things she imagined are so embedded in her subconscious that there's a part of her that actually believes she died. There's a part of her. She wept when her period came because she wasn't pregnant, and these guys had not touched her. But it, that image was so real that when she finally got into counseling, the thing they had to deal with was what she thought had happened. The human mind is incredibly powerful. The problem with PTSD is you cannot fix it. You as a lay person cannot fix it for somebody else. They need to be seen by a professional so that someone who is trained can watch them tell their story and can watch how their body responds to be able to know how to help them. Um, I had PTSD back in the early 80s. My husband and I were sitting on the sofa one evening, almost two years after the event. And I'm back at work, I'm functioning, I'm doing really well. I mean, on the outside, I was a woman who had it together. And I never watched anything that could remotely trigger my PTSD, because I wasn't going to go down that road. So we're watching a totally family show, and something totally innocuous came on, like probably a bounty commercial. And all of a sudden, I was in a full-blown panic mode, so traumatized I couldn't speak. And it was the first time my husband had seen me like this. He said, that's it. He said, I don't know who you need to see, but he says, you will have an appointment tomorrow. My commitment to you is I will find someone and I will have it for you tomorrow. Praise God he did. Because the, the mudslide illustration I gave you, when you try to fix PTSD yourself or when you try to go after a panic one of the panic scenarios, which we will discuss more next week. It's like Susie Homemaker out there with her broom and her dustpan trying to clean up this mudslide. Every place you poke the mudslide, you trigger new slides. I was trying to, to hold it together and be a professional and do the things I was trained to do, and I needed, I needed to look good. I, was, I had an important job at the hospital. I needed to have it together. The harder I struggled to hold it together, the more I fell apart. And it will be this way in everyone with PTSD. Um, what works with PTSD is psychotherapy, where they let you talk, uh, biofeedback, so that, you, so that the person who has it will recognize when they're starting to go down that road and interrupt the circuit. It ha you, it's, it, it's a learned response. You have to learn it. Somewhere in my notes here, it says, uh, there's a specific eye movement <coughs> therapy they do, that is very effective with PTSD, and they're now using art to train people with PTSD so that they, uh, to help process what you've been through. The human brain is absolutely amazing in what it can do. And in the time I have left, I want to talk about the resources that you have. Um, you want schizophrenia? What do you know about schizophrenia? Other than the voices? 
Okay, does everyone who hears the voice in their head, are they all schizophrenics? No. Is it my job to try to figure out who's who? No. First night I spent in Hawaii, there was a woman outside my motel room and she yelled all night long. And I didn't know what it was called, but I knew it was mental illness. The poor woman. They have arguments. You'll see them all by themselves in the park and they're having big arguments with somebody. And, and they're there by themselves. They have no peace within their own mind. And these people, the best thing we as lay health evangelists can do is help them get to a mental health professional, get the right medication for their condition, and then bless them with a good diet and exercise and what you know about the need for sleep and what you know about um, Rhonda, who's coming next, will talk about relaxation techniques. These people have a tough time. Yes, sir? Do you think that like, some people that they think they're schizophrenic they might have a like, kind of demon possession or something? See, I'm not equipped to know the difference. As a lay person, I don't know. But this mother who asked me to come and pray for her 43-year-old son who's hearing voices, it's a possibility. And so do I have the right to pray for someone with schizophrenia that God will remove the voices and they'll be healed? Yeah. I do. Do I have the right to pray for someone that's demon-possessed that God will remove the voices and they'll be healed? I do. So as a lay person, I don't have to know what caused the problem. I know the God who knows how to fix it. When Jesus said that I would do greater things than he did, he wasn't kidding. We need to trust him and be willing to walk through the process as he unfolds it. Those of us that tend to risk for the finish line, sometimes we miss the blessing in the journey. So may God get a good, strong grip on all of us. And do, is there another question? No? Always paranoid about everything. Okay, really good question. A paranoid personality, but they're not willing to seek help because they're afraid of the professionals. If I go to the doctor, they're just going to give me medicine and it's poison and it's all this. They fear everything. Wow, it's going to take a lot of prayer. Are they willing? Are, are, will they even go for a walk with you? They will then bless them with what you can. Rhonda's going to be coming with compresses and things that would help them relax. If they can relax, the fear won't be as great. I love in Scripture, 365 times in Scripture, it says, fear not. And it says it in ways like, do not be afraid, fret not, be not dismayed. But 365 times to the count, God says, you don't have to live scared. This is is so cool to me. If in the worst year of my life, God has a new promise for me each day that I don't have to live afraid. How you're ever going to get to share that with that person, I don't know. But that's where the hope comes from. That's how you face it and you get to keep trucking. I had one more thing I wanted to tell you. What was it? Oh, I want to go over the books. These are available. Depression the Way Out. Excellent book for lay people really covers things very nicely. Making a good brain great is from the Amen Clinic. And they take uh, scans of the brain and see what parts of the brain are being overstimulated or understimulated, where the problems are, and then they prescribe specific supplements for those parts of the brain. This book, available at the public library, is a really good resource. And they use lots of natural things. They use medication when medication is the required treatment, but there's an amazing number of things can be done with natural things. Really fun book. The Secret of the Brain. This is from a PBS uh, series, and this is where I got all the good stuff on the aging brain and the second flowering, and just because you are getting mature, we all know people into their 90s and even their 100s that are still have crystal clear minds. It's that lifestyle thing. It's the choices we made. As a lay health professional, the single book I can recommend that will do you the most good and you can freely give with total confidence is the Ministry of Healing. It's now available in paperback, an inexpensive book, but if you got someone that's struggling with depression and you give them this whole, even this little paperback book, they are going to be overwhelmed and it's going to sit there. 
There is a smaller book entitled Help in Daily Living that's available through the ABC. It's, I found it on my dad's literature rack when I was 14, and I read it, and it has blessed me to this day. It's the final four chapters of Ministry of Healing. It deals with the mental health issues in such practical, reasonable ways. Help in daily, if you're going to be a lay health evangelist, I encourage you to have two or three of these in your car because you will come across people that that is the exact book they need. Get it, read it yourself so you know what it is, and then hand it out with confidence. We've talked today about the electrical system of the brain. This, Mrs. White started talking about the body's electrical system in the 1860s, people. Early in her public life, she started talking about the electrical system. The doctors of her day, electricity, where, where was electricity used in the 1800s before the turn of the century? They weren't even on, we didn't even have street lamps. Houses were not electrified. The fact that she would even say there was an electrical system in the human body enabled people to call her just a crazy woman. Well, praise God, with all our advanced enlightenment, we know that the entire body runs on an electrical system. So, do you want to hear about... We talked about the myelin sheath, and I promise we will deal with those diseases when I come next week. The diseases that happen when the myelin sheath gets damaged are things like MS, and there's a whole... I'll deal with that next time. But the nervous system, that nerve damage, what does it look like? Okay, one type of nerve damage, a nerve can just flat out be malnourished and deteriorate. That's why getting those essential fatty acids in your diet, that's why a well-balanced fruits and vegetables kind of diet is so important. What if you have scar tissue around a nerve? What does it do to the nerve? Impulses get stopped. But let, let's say that the big nerve in the back of your knee got strangled by scar tissue. What happens every time you move your leg? that nerve gets jerked and it starts screaming. The only way to fix it is to go in and surgically cut the tissue, remove the scar tissue. I'm a lady who grows scar tissue like other people grow hair, so when they operate on me, I just make volumes of scar tissue. And um, it was my knee that had the nerve strangled with scar tissue. And they go, well, if we cut the scar tissue out, she's going to grow twice as much scar tissue to replace it. And who knows how much of the nerve is going to get caught next time. So you know what they did? They took a piece of the muscle and wrapped it around the nerve, an extra layer of insulation which protected the nerve from scar tissue. This was, what, 35, almost 40 years ago now, and that nerve has been fine to this day. But I have another nerve that I've had 11 surgeries on one knee. And when I was about 17, they operated. And after that surgery, all of a sudden, I had a place about this big on the outside of my leg that was numb. And we did all the hydrotherapy things. I took all the supplements. We did everything we could do to bless my nervous system. And 40 years later, that nerve is, was still numb. I got introduced to medical lasers less than a year ago. And I started using them on my back and other things where the nerve damage is really intense in my body. All of a sudden, I noticed that that place where the nerves, I've had, no, well, I've, had, I've had a combination of no feeling and discomfort for all these years, those nerves now have some normal feeling in them. So they tell you nerves cannot be regenerated, that cannot be restored. I went to this laser seminar and they said, well, you know, we, nerves are the slowest regenerating tissue in the human body and you do have brain cells in your body that are never replaced. They are there. When they're gone, they're gone, and they're not regenerated. You hear about, you know, the whole human body regenerates. Well, for the most part, that's true. But there are certain cells that don't do this, as I studied on the brain this week. Um, in my body, as I bring this healthy electrical current, it works. Here's another good piece of news about the human body. When your body can choose sick or it can choose healthy, it chooses healthy every time. So as you implement the lifestyle things with somebody, your body has an option of staying where it was or doing this behave, responding in a more healthful way. Your body itself chooses health. In my body, I told you I have a big computer. I have 16 working electrodes in the epidural space of my spine. The battery that runs it is internal. I let them do that about five years ago. I, prior to that, I, there was an actual box that I carried in my pocket 
that was the computer that ran my body. Now it's all internal and it's, it's a very nice system. But what it is, it's an electrical system that provides healthy current instead of the damaged stuff that my body was creating. And it is amazing and I thank God for it. Can you believe the body can do that? And the people that make my computer are the people that are doing the map, the brain mapping right now. They're implanting electrodes. Electrodes that are almost the exact same generation as what's in my spine are now being implanted in people's brains to short circuit Tourette's and short circuit uh, Parkinson's. It's, it's cutting edge medical technology. It's really cool stuff. The thought I want to leave you with when you are dealing with a mental health issue, ask God to show you how to short circuit the cycle. Whether it's depression, whether it's bipolar, whether it's schizophrenia, if you can divert their attention, you can short circuit it. And if you can help them learn how to short circuit it for themselves, they can be better. Uh, when the gloomy thoughts start coming, last night Roger was at the table with this man and he said, he said you could look at him and you could see it coming. I would say, you need to think happy thoughts. And he'd get Jason started laughing. But we have to learn how to do that for ourselves. Because stuff happens in this world. Good people get hurt. And we have to know how to deal with it. Are there any questions before I let you have a short break? <laughs> have you ever heard of using coconut oil in treatment of dementia? Yes, as a matter of fact, I have. And I, I'm one of those ladies that teach people how to cook with coconut oil. Yeah because it is a natural saturated fat as opposed to Crisco, which are these long chains that your liver goes, what in the world is that and where do we put it? I mean, the body was never designed to recognize that. Whereas coconut oil being a natural atom, our body knows what to do with it. And I am not in favor of using it freely, but yeah, there's, there's use for it. I have heard of that. I heard that, um, I got into the chia seed about a year ago. Okay. Friend of mine said that Flax seed is actually taking, robbing you of bees. And, and we're, it, it, we only have a couple studies of it, not a huge, big study, but it's, it's a small study. That flax, they tell pregnant women not to use flax while they're pregnant because it robs them of bees. So, Interesting. Yeah, so if you get a chance, when I come next week, we will talk more about chia seed and flax because it is amazing. And, and flax, you know, they tell you you've got to grind it in order to get the good out of it. Well, we like it whole and bread much better. But anyway, we all have to figure out how and in what ways we're willing to use it. I am really, I cannot stress strongly enough, a wide variety of unrefined foods. I think we need the chia seeds and the flax seed and the sunflower seed and every other good thing God gave us. And that's what actually really protects us in the long haul. God, um, oh, someday catch me and we'll talk about soybeans because I have a whole thing I do on that. God would not create a product that blesses half the population of the world and curses the other half. I mean, God just wouldn't do that. He's better than that. So shall we bow our heads? Heavenly Father, I thank you for these people that have come who want to learn how to lift Jesus up in their community, to lift Jesus up before their friends. Lord, be with them as they attend this ambassador's program. May they have the pleasure of seeing you in the courses, and then may they take it into their world. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Enjoy your break. Get a good walk.